Every year, the National Urban League releases its highly anticipated report on the state of black America. The report has become a national touchstone for the social and economic status of African Americans and Hispanic communities. This year's report, One Nation Underemployed, Jobs Rebuild America, addresses the growing un- and underemployment crisis and how African Americans and other communities of color can recover from the losses of the Great Recession and forge a path to economic stability. Each year, we ask the question, what is the state of black America? Today, our esteemed panelist will answer that question as it relates to black men and discuss the solutions for overcoming the challenges facing men and boys of color. What is the state of black men and how do we improve it? Joining me to discuss this is Dr. Randall Pinkett, entrepreneur, chairman and CEO of BCT Partners. He is also a contributor to the 2014 State of Black America Report and Spencer Overton, interim president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. Welcome brothers, thank you for being here. Uh, Let's start dealing with employment. Uh, We know that since we've been keeping stats, African-American men have been double-digit unemployment. Um, Why? Um, If we can really look at what does that, why is that the case perpetually for decades? And where are the areas that we can begin to see uh, an increase in employment and what are the tactics that we're, we're, we're using? Yeah, so I think the best way to think about it is think about the pipeline from the cradle all the way to one's career. I mean, we have inadequacies and imbalances in the educational system. That is a contributor. We think about the job training programs that we have available to us, which aren't serving our communities properly. We think about just the overall economy right now, which is still struggling in its own way, shape, and form, which means that jobs aren't as plentiful. And then we think about the ex-offender population, which Mm -hmm. is a significant challenge to legal barriers that prevent them from even obtaining employment, much less seeking employment. The the last thing I'll say is I I think that the problem we face is as much a problem around the jobs that are out there as it is jobs that we create. And I'll say that a little differently, that it's it's not just about looking to what corporate America or, you know, the traditional workforce has Mm -hmm. to offer, but what can we do to promote more of our own businesses, that we're creating our own jobs, because the social barriers are often more easily addressed when there's somebody across the table who understands your experience. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we can create more businesses create more jobs in our communities we also are positioning ourselves to be more understanding and more sensitive to the needs of this very vulnerable population mm-hmm. Spencer can you can you build on that because if if, if we were to create a formula right. um, for how to see increased jobs I mean I think um, Randall talked really about the things that aren't happening in a lot of ways and some of the recommendations but if we were to give a, a, a prognosis to a local city to say look if you can begin doing these three things right. we guarantee you over a period of time you'll start to see black men's um, uh, employment increase what would those three things be well I think in terms of schools focusing on schools uh, and shifting from the, the kind of the school to prison pipeline scenario that we have right now uh, you know, young black men are two and a half times more likely than whites to be suspended Mm -hmm. for, for, you know, basically the same activity, right? So the school piece is a part of it. I think the employment piece, Randall mentioned uh, the, you know, former offender issue, Uh, but I think the numbers are in 2001, child born 2001, uh, African Americans are about 36 uh, 36% of them are likely to spend some time in Uh, prison in their life, whereas uh, only uh, two, three percent of whites would spend time in prison. So when we talk about a job application that has a checkbox in terms of, you know, former criminal uh, status, I mean, that's an issue in terms of a barrier to people participating in the economy. So dealing with these little things that have a huge impact on whether or not people can participate in our economy, you know, that it's significant. Well, and let's deal with the nuances, though, right? right? Because because what I hear you all saying, I think, in in by and large, right. speaks to a lot of the unemployed aspects of this. But there's clearly an underemployed class of black men right. um, mm-hmm. who have not necessarily gone to jail, um, may have only sp- completed a certain level of school, mm-hmm. maybe only had a certain level of training. How do we deal with this underemployed class of black men? Um, that aren't dealing with the same kind of challenges, but some nuanced ones, because I would bet that there is an opportunity there that sometimes we're just missing. Yeah, and I I don't think we're doing as good a job as we could focusing on what we are doing, on where the jobs are and where they're going. Mm -hmm. So we talk about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. You know, 
not to say that there's anything wrong with targeting uh, construction trades or manufacturing jobs or the like, but we all know those jobs not only are gone, but they're right. not coming back. Right. And so we have to challenge ourselves, I think, to really raise the bar and raise expectations of what we believe black men can do. Right. That if we set the bar for manufacturing and construction, we're going to make the target or we'll miss the target. But if we set it higher, where are our jobs going? It's health. It's knowledge workers, it's technology, it's the like. I mean, we launched a program uh, in Newark, New Jersey, looking at using uh, young men of color to build mobile applications. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really where I think you find the real opportunity, which is growth industries that folks can really step in and do the work. And I don't think we're doing a good job of doing that as we could. And, and so many people, I think, really want to be empowered. They don't want to be the lackey to someone else here, right? And so this notion of new skills and new technologies and being able to build businesses and apps and other things like online, I think that th there's a lot of potential there. Well, and, but, but clearly, we're all not going to work in the tech space. We're all not right. going to work in the STEM space. Um, and to you all's point, and, and this may seem a, a little more arbitrary, but, but how are we talking to our boys about what is possible? And then more importantly, and, and maybe we should deal here, how are we dealing with our boys and young men around uh, life mapping? Mm -hmm. What it means to be able to say, here are three things as a kid that I might be interested in doing and then walking with a young man to say, here are the steps that you need to take to potentially get there. I often see, I often see us saying, where do you want to go to school? Right. But not necessarily, how are we mapping out your life in a way that it gets you from here to building a business, to having a career? Or am I off? No, no you're, on, you're on point, Jeff. And I look at my own career as an entrepreneur. If you asked me when I was young, did I want to become one, I would have told you no, because I didn't have anyone who I knew who owned a business and who looked like me, who I could relate to. And it took somebody, another black male, who I grew up with, who started his business, that inspired me to say, if he can do it, then why can't I do it? So it's giving us examples. The media plays a role in that. It's us being the example, and we play a role in that, that we have to be not just the parents to our children, but we have to be the parents to the children that don't have parents. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think an another topic we don't talk enough about is the entire foster care system, which mm -hmm. has you know, black boys and young men of color and Hispanic boys who are in need of homes and in need of role models who, who aren't getting them. And so I think we all have to double our efforts to be examples, but also to take someone under our wing that we can give them that life map that you just described, which I, th I think is very important. Spencer, you want to weigh in? I, I just think we have to recognize that, you know, this isn't just a scenario where people we can cast them off or they're just not trying and they're not working hard one of the nice things about you know my brother's keeper the president's recent initiative is the fact that we're all vested as opposed to thinking that oh these people just aren't working hard and we don't have to care about them i think more people recognize this is an issue that we need to uh, care about that the future of our country depends on it mm -hmm. but, but let's deal with that a little bit because i i think there's been a lot of misunderstanding about my brother's keeper mm -hmm. about what it means for black men as, as i read uh, the, 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 what the initiative is, it really is about senior level folks looking around the country at people that are doing work right um, versus figuring out how the, the uh, federal government is going to save black men and boys. Right. And, and, and I, I think it's an important nuance mm -hmm. because there are people that are doing great work. There yes. are programs that are doing good job. There are initiatives that are seeing the needle turned on everything from high school graduation to literacy to employment to reentry. Um, but often they get no light, they get no shine, and they're not um, uh, replicated, right? right? So that to me is what I hear coming from the federal government, how do we identify these folks? How do we put money behind them? Yeah. How do we increase that? How do we, as black men, as a community, begin to better tell the stories of what's working? Because what I see so often is we're much more excited about uh, talking about the problems. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the My Brother's Keeper, to me, is, is an attempt to, to change that conversation, that we're not just talking about the state of black men or males of color, but what are we, what are we doing? Because right. there's lots that's been going on, let's be clear. Yes. I mean, you look at what the Open Society's done, others have stepped in, uh, California Endowment, Robert Wood Johnson, they're all right. putting money and in. And those are just foundations. Those are just foundations, right. but the fact is they've right. been at the table already. Yes. Before the White House made an announcement, they were doing right. work to find best practices. Yes. I think having the president's voice and the White House's power behind highlighting that is changing the dialogue, but 
what I think is good about My Brother's Keeper is that I think it's going to help amplify the ability to take what is working and to disseminate those best practices more broadly. Again, it's already been happening. I think now we just have more eyes, more organization, and you and I know one plus one equals three when you find synergy. And I think what we're moving toward now is finding the synergy between what have been disparate activities that are moving toward a growing movement and a moving dialogue around how we solve this problem. Uh, you know, Kellogg did a lot of work, has done a lot of work with this, and the Joint Center uh, ha has done a lot of work, Dr. Gail Christopher, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, young males of color. Uh, the White House, you know, the federal government can't do everything in part because the federal government's not working all that great. The president can do what's within his power. You know, Congress is a bit polarized. I think the president, both bringing attention and using the platform as well as utilizing these agencies. I do think that there are some things that are happening in different agencies where they're asking what can we do in this particular agency to change the dynamic with regard to, to young males of color. Right, but, but and, and at the bottom line, my, my only issue is that we shouldn't be looking for the federal government to mm -hmm. be doing everything. Oh, yeah, uh, and, 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 and I think it's important for people to be clear. That, I mean, the, the My Brother's Keeper, there's not a lot of federal resources dollars behind no, it's that. It's partnerships. Right. It's partnerships. Right. Which so, is what's beautiful. Which is what's it. beautiful about it. The federal government is doing what it can do best, which is be a catalyst, be a convener, and and then be a kind of bully pulpit to say, we need you to rally around this. And I think this is a movement that's needed that level of prominence to take it to the next level. Right. And we, I think enough has been done in the absence of that, and I think President Obama stepping up really does signify a window of opportunity that we yes. now have to really take some more responsibility for to step up to the plate. So I'm really proud to see what's happening. I'm more excited to see where it goes. I agree. We're ta talking about taking more responsibility, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about men's health. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in May of last year, I lost my father to prostate cancer. Right. Um, seven year fight with fourth stage cancer. I do not have a black male friend whose father has not had prostate cancer. Um, and so whether we're talking about cancer or whether we're talking about a number of the other pre preventable diseases, right. whether we're talking about stress, we, we still as black men don't seem to be shouting the clarion call that we're in a state of crisis as it relates to our health. Right. Overton, why, why does that continue to be the case? And what are some of the things we can begin to do to address it? Well, you know, as you mentioned, the life expectancy of black males is shorter uh, than many other populations. Uh, and the problem is not just, uh, uh, you know, cancer, things in the end of life. I mean, there are also issues in terms of mental health. There are issues in terms of um, uh, parental kind of both responsibility and health, uh, uh, that, that type of thing. So I, I think that a, a targeted uh, notion in terms of, you know, real answers and solutions in terms of men's health and focusing men on health. But what does that issue. look like? Uh, I think it's a, a particular agenda. Actually, we have a, a few policy reports at the Joint Center where we lay out uh, a few uh, items that we need to do in terms of a community. I mean, part of it is a real assertive uh, health care and, and outreach in terms of uh, the African-American community and males in particular mm -hmm. and changing the dynamic in terms of health and, and what it is. Often we ignore our health as black men as opposed to kind of taking responsibility and kind of embracing it. But, but when the rubber meets the road, because I think the right. policy pieces are clear, they're right. necessary. Right. Um, the research is necessary. But, but how are we helping um, even wives talk to their husbands in the home yeah. about health. How are we helping children talk to their right. fathers? Uh, we, we know a lot of times men aren't going to be healthy mm -hmm. unless it's for somebody else. And, and whether that's right or wrong, there's an opportunity there to begin to help our families, our communities, talk and engage men. Uh, you, you got There's a problem a with me, come on. Weakness. There's a notion that no, I think that's not some, about No, but I'm not saying that's true, but I'm just saying I think that people feel as though talking about mental health, talking about uh, being uh, sick and not strong, that there is an element of weakness, and I think we've got to get past that. Yeah, I think it's going to take men stepping up to the plate to change that dialogue. I don't think it can come from anyone but others who can articulate the kinds of experiences that you've articulated relative to your father, that it has to be taken out of the hospitals. And, and we know we have a whole history of distrust mm -hmm. for, the, you know, the, for the medical profession, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to take that conversation to each other and we have to change the dialogue. And, and let's be clear, health issues are very sensitive issues. And so it can be a very delicate conversation. So I think undergirding that, 
with the tools to have the conversation. I mean, taking it to churches, taking it to the home, taking it to men's groups, fellowship groups, take your pick. But we have to be the ones that say, we're going to hold each other accountable, that when I see you're not eating right, when I see you're not getting to the doctor, when I see you're not being mindful of your health, that we're holding each other accountable. It has to start there. No one can come and tell us what we're going to do until we tell each other what we should be doing. I think that's right, although I would say we focus a lot on education, focus a lot on criminal justice. The health piece is an important piece that we need to be mindful of. I, I agree, and I'll just underscore that to say it's a piece that doesn't get as much attention as I believe it deserves. Right. And it's one that is crippling our community very silently. And, and, and your example is, is just so poignant that we, if we don't begin to turn the corner on the culture of health within our community, the numbers are going to just continue to get worse. Now, this, this whole notion of, of fatherhood, um, fatherlessness um, is something we talk about regularly. Um, but but my, my concern around that is, again, we, we do a lot talking about the bad, uh, not a lot talking about the good. We do a lot focusing on the negative. There are a ton of great fathers in this country that are having serious issues with the courts and child support um, to see children that they want to see. Uh, how do we, not necessarily through a, a government program, um, but through how we deal with each other, begin to talk about advocating for men as opposed to simply just holding men accountable? It can't just be an either-or proposition. Yeah, I think that the, well, I know you said it's not, it's not a government per se, but I think that there, part of the problem has been policy that has targeted uh, s single mothers as heads of households yes. that has created some disincentives not only to fatherhood but also to, 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 to being a husband. Uh, that if you know you're looking to be eligible for certain uh, benefits, that claiming the, the husband or, or acknowledging another income could render you ineligible. And so there's all of these back room conversations right. that don't want to acknowledge that the father is a part of the child's life. So I think we have to change that from a policy standpoint. I do. And there's a great example in Maryland yes. with the Center for Urban Families working with the state of Maryland's Department of Human Resources that's piloting something to do exactly that. But then the second part to your point is really, again, changing the dialogue amongst ourselves. I don't think we celebrate fatherhood mm -hmm. as much. I mean, you know, they say Mother's Day is the day where most phone calls are made, and we've got AT&T right. as a sponsor. They probably know this better than I do. <laughs> you know, I think we've got to really celebrate, recognize, and reinforce. And, and it's delicate because I don't want to celebrate you for doing your job. Right. But I Absolutely. do want to honor you when you're doing a good job. And sometimes it's not just about doing your job, it's about allowing other people to see you doing what you do. Yes. Right. So, that, so that there is a level of reverberation of that energy and spirit. And I think we get, we get caught up in the difference between the two. We do, we do. And I tell folks all the time, the difference between being a dad and being a father. Sp Spencer. Spencer. I, I was just gonna say, we need to be solutions oriented as opposed to looking for someone to blame. Oh, right. hey, there's the boogeyman in terms of that black male criminal, or there's the person who's not being the responsible father or whatever. I mean, it's almost like we're looking to blame uh, someone as opposed to looking for solutions. And I think we need to be a lot and more solutions. And replicating those solutions. Yeah, yeah, exactly, lifting them up. Let, let me do this because again, we, we could go on and on and on and, uh, about all of this. I'd, I'd like to, to, to shift really quickly um, back to that policy piece. If there was a piece of legislation that is either in a state body or a federal body right now that you think we should be paying most attention to that in some way, shape or form pushes to support black men, what would that piece of legislation be? You know, I, I would say uh, the example I gave a moment ago with the, the Center for Urban Families, uh, my firm BCT is supporting them and looking at the, how this process can be refined. Uh, and again, it's, it's amazing that this is so groundbreaking, that they have a program that seeks to keep the father involved with the life of the child, and if they're married, to keep the couple together in taking care of the child. Now that just should not sound so revolutionary, but let's be clear for those that are watching that that is a, a pilot mm -hmm. based on work that had been done locally to see if they can expand it statewide. Now why don't we have that already? So if I were to advance anything, we have to have families, we have to have couples, we have to have married families, ideally, or, or at least uh, non-custodial parents working together to look out for the best interests of their children, and that should not be groundbreaking. That should be taken for granted, and that's what I would push from a policy perspective. In the states, low-hanging fruit, 
collateral consequences as a result of uh, being a former felon. So we talk about felon mm -hmm. disenfranchisement, uh, employment issues, getting a school loan, all the things that people need to be productive members of society as opposed to uh, eliminating those opportunities from people forever. We, we need to restore that in order to really recognize all the human capital that's out there that's being wasted. And that could happen in the states right now. Last question, because you all are so brilliant, uh, but stoic. Um, <laughs> what do you love most about being a black man? I'll let you start with that. <laughs> let me start. I, I love the, uh, the, the legacy mm -hmm. of, of black men. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you know your history, and, and you know, it could go from Solomon Northrup to one of, uh, you know, one of, one of my heroes, our, our President Obama, to, to Maynard Jackson, one of my icons as an entrepreneur. Uh, it's a it's a it's a storied legacy. It's a celebrated legacy, and it's one that I'm I'm so so proud to consider myself just a small part of that tradition. Mm. Uh, it, I couldn't be prouder uh, to say that I'm part of the legacy of being a black man. Uh, agreed. Uh, being a part of a larger mission, something much larger than myself, and being connected to a community and having a responsibility to that community, to me, that's uh, you know what's. Uh, most most valuable to me about being a black male. I think that's one. I think those are the kind of conversations we need to have in addition to pushing the policy pieces. I want to thank both of you for joining me. Um, this challenging 15 minutes to talk sure. about the state of black men. Thanks, uh, you so all much. did an incredible job with it. Uh, thank you. Uh, share this web series, you all, with your social media friends and followers. And I think, as Spencer really said, let's continue this solution session. Use the hashtag jobs for all if you want to share something. But most importantly, get involved somewhere. The State of Black America web series has been presented by AT&T. Thank you, AT&T, for your continued, continued support of the National Urban League. We also want to thank Comcast for their production support of the State of Black America web series. Together, we are empowering communities and changing lives. You can follow me at Jeff's Nation on Twitter. But for more information on the State of Black America and to purchase the book, which I recommend you do, uh, visit the National Urban League at NUL.org.